Welcome back, everyone. I think we are ready to begin. We just had such a wonderful cocktail hour. I feel like um, we've all been together just outside the, the gala doors, and now we're um, taking, taking our seats uh, for the rest of the evening. I want to welcome everyone from across the country and around the world to the Lamb Foundation's Day of Giving Research Summary. I'm Sue Sherman, Chief Executive Officer of the Lamb Foundation. As you saw in that video that I, uh, we, we played during the break, there are a lot of exciting new developments in the field of lamb science. Tonight, you'll have the chance to hear from some of our senior scientists and learn more about the latest trends in lamb research. But first, I'd like to share a little history. This event, like the Lamb Community Cocktail Hour we just participated in, our Breath of Hope Gala are all part of the special Lamb Foundation tradition where we come together to celebrate our warm and welcoming community and to reaffirm our shared goal of a future without Lamb. To get there, we need to continue funding innovative research. Since our founding 26 years ago, research has been at the center of the Lamb Foundation's mission. We have contributed to significant breakthroughs, including the first ever treatment for lamb. And there's no one better positioned than us to discover more improved, improved treatments and ultimately a cure for lymphangiomyomatosis. Why? Because of the intense commitment of our unique lamb community. Tonight, I want to acknowledge the extraordinary fellowship of patients, families, scientists, and clinicians whose close collaboration continues to drive this promising research forward. It's something I like to call LAM power. LAM power is what inspires us to do all we can do to improve the quality of life for women living with LAM, to never give up, to be able to transform LAM from a deadly illness to a treatable disease. What exactly is lamb power in practice? Lamb power is the patient who faces her diagnosis with determination to fight for herself and to fight for her lamb sisters. Stephanie Weber personifies lamb power. Two years ago, Stephanie was struggling to breathe. She had trouble caring for her three children and the golden retrievers that she lovingly breeds. She ended up in the emergency room with a collapsed lung and the doctors told her she would need a lamb transplant within the week. But Stephanie found a second chance and hope with the drug Sirolimus. Sirolimus slowed her disease progression and helped her avoid that imminent transplant. Stephanie is well aware that this wouldn't have happened without the Lamb Foundation and our community. We've helped fund Sirolimus clinical trials and pushed for its approval by the FDA. Stephanie has also turned to the Lamb community for emotional support and to learn all she can, all that there is to know about Lamb. She's also giving back by helping to raise money for more research. More research because the cruel truth is that for many women with Lamb, Sirolimus is not working as well as it does for Stephanie. Others are facing heartbreaking decisions between having a family or facing potentially devastating lung decline or worse. More research because we have fundamental questions that remain unanswered, like why only women? What triggers this disease? How can we measure progression more effectively? And how can we someday prevent any more women from getting this diagnosis? Lamb power has kept us ahead of the curve. Even during this challenging time, despite the pandemic, no one has lost focus. Because of all of you, our research funding has been sustained and even increased. Our intimacy and unity have been preserved through Zoom calls, personal outreach, and the collective teamwork of the LAMB community. Over the past 18 months, our scientists have continued to make LAMB's research their priority. Above all, you, our patients, have shown extraordinary resilience. You make the best of what is, which is endlessly inspiring to all of us. You have the courage to participate in power research, you fight for yourselves and live your best lives. And that's why the collective foundation works and works for you. Thank you to all of you. Now I would love to, I would love to and like to introduce our two speakers for the evening. 
who will discuss the most current developments in lamb research and how scientists are adopting new technologies that are gonna, going to help us get where we need to go to answer the most important questions. Thanks to those of you who sent in your questions in advance, giving our speakers a better chance to fully address them and to help us synthesize them. I will be your moderator for tonight, um, and I am thrilled to introduce our speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Nishant Gupta, who is Associate Pref Professor of the Division of Pulmonary Critical Care and Sleep Medicine at the University of Cincinnati, and importantly, he is the LAM Foundation's new Scientific Director. Nishan is no newcomer to LAM. He's been involved with LAM research for more than 10 years, He's participated in six of our research conferences, has been funded multiple times for his LAM research, and has been treating LAM patients for more than a decade. We are extremely fortunate that Nishant's talent and expertise have enabled him to transition seamlessly into this role and honestly hit the ground running. A few things not delineated in Nishant's CV would be that he is the proud father of Nina and Nathan, husband to Christine, um, Nina and Nathan sometimes require him to mute his Zoom uh, meetings, um, but it's always um, a fun thing to watch. He has a very wry sense of humor, and it's, it's a, a great opportunity to work with him. Joining Nishant on tonight's call is Dr. Scott Budinger, who is the Chief of Pulmonary and Critical Care in the Department of Medicine, the Ernst S. Baisley Professor of Airway Diseases and is Professor of Medicine and Cellular and Molecular Biology at the Northwestern Feinberg School of Medicine. Scott's research focus is on understanding how aging biology intersects with the age-related risk of acute and chronic lung disease. He has a wealth of expertise with the new technologies we will discuss tonight and has generously, though only recently, joined our LAM family um, we are very interested to hear of his knowledge and perspectives. Having only met him briefly during our August LAM research conference, I can only say that he's a curious and warm clinician scientist with a, and very clearly a quick study appreciating what it takes for a rare disease community like ours to make significant impact on research. I welcome both of you and thank you for sharing your evening with the global LAM community. Does everyone have audio? Thank yes. you, Sue. Perfect. Great. So in August, we convened the virtual LAM research conference titled Transforming Our Understanding of LAM, The Path Forward. Um, as I listened to the introductions by both of you um, and the excellent panel of speakers, I had two main takeaways that I'd love to explore this evening with our larger community. Um, the first is that our scientists uh, who are studying LAM are rapidly adopting these new research technologies um, that's enabling them to better understand what's happening in the micro environment of the lung, meaning at a cellular level. And the second takeaway is that there are are several potential ways that these technologies will influence where we go next in the study of LAM. So I'd like to begin um, by asking a first tough question to you, Scott. Um, could you offer us an introduction to these two main technologies that were talked about, uh, single cell RNA sequencing and spatial transcriptomics, easy for me to say, um, and maybe follow up on that with your hope for what these methods might offer to us in the future? Absolutely. Um, you know, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Nishant, and thank you for the, uh, to the LAM Foundation for hosting um, both this talk tonight. I, I had a chance to come into the, at the end of the cocktail hour there, and it was really moving um, to hear um, um, all of the patients speaking. Um, and uh, um, you really have a wonderful, wonderful research community um, uh, very dedicated people and have done just remarkable things um, in the LAM Foundation in uh, um, uh, seeding new work um, and developing therapies for, um, for this disease that, as you said, have transformed it from a fatal disease to one that is treatable over the long term. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to speak. I'd be... I'd be happy if it's okay with you, I can share a couple of slides that I've presented to sort of, because these are complex technologies and sometimes it's easier to see them. Um, so if that's, if you, if, if it's all right with you, I'll go Absolutely. ahead. Absolutely. I think we're making you a co-host or maybe you already are. 
I think I am. So uh, let me just get there. Um, um, so what we focused on in this conference while we're getting ready here is the, um, uh, the, uh, these single cell RNA sequencing technologies. And um, these, are, uh, these are technologies, can everyone see my screen there now? Yes. Okay, um, um, so, so these are really have been transformative technologies. The technology was developed in 2014. Um, it really was um, applied to clinical samples beginning in 2018-19 um, and uh, has uh, it in, at scale um, and has really sort of transformed the way we think about um, uh, disease in general and lung disease in particular. And all of you will remember this sort of central dogma of, uh, of biology that you learned in high school, um, which is that uh, all of the cells in your body have the exact same DNA. Um, uh, that DNA in every cell is, uh, is translated into RNA molecules, and every cell has different RNA molecules specific to that type of cell. And those RNA molecules then encode proteins. And if we think about the information content that's available in each of those different substances within a cell, the DNA, the RNA, and the protein, the protein has the most information, the RNA has a lot more information, and the DNA has less information. But the DNA still has a lot of information, and everybody that's on this call um, that knows about LAM knows how important the research that uh, some of the people that are on this call have done um, in discovering the mutations and the genetic basis for LAM and for um, TSC, for the tuberous sclerosis complex diseases and the relationships between those. Um, but we, and we've been able to actually look at RNA for some time to, to understand RNA for some time. The problem, and uh, the problem has been um, uh, that uh, RNA actually looks at the whole tissue. So you remember that all of the tissues in your body um, are made up of individual cells. And those individual cells are organized into complex structures like the lung um, that we're talking about here. And then those complex structures are then organized into the body. Um, the lung contains over 40 different cell populations, lots and lots of different cells. So it's very, under, very difficult to understand it when we look at the RNA, because the problem we have is that we see, that we see a smoothie. Right, so if we take a piece of lung and we grind it up, right, um, we're actually looking at the smoothie. And if we taste this smoothie and something tastes bad in this smoothie, right, we can't tell if it's bad because there were bad blueberries in this smoothie or maybe there was just one bad pineapple, right? And what single cell RNA sequencing does is it lets us look at each one of the individual fruit blocks, each one of these cells that went into making that smoothie. And then we can identify, you know, which one of these things, which one of these cells, even if it's just one little piece, might be contributing to something going wrong with the entire smoothie. And that's, that's what this technology does. And this is what the data look like. You get a lot of different cells, thousands and thousands of different cells. And in each cell, you get lots and lots of genes, and they're represented in these plots that are difficult to understand, but each one of these dots is a cell within a lung. And this is the way a computer then can actually look at a lung um, uh, broken up into individual cell populations. And um, the beauty of this approach has really become clear because you know, if we think about um, you know, sort of LAM or any lung disease as a painting that we wanna uncover, um, the way that we have done traditional biology, and it's been very effective, is that we've uncovered one little part of the painting, right? And then we've worked around the edge of the, that, edges of that painting to get more and more information about the painting. Single cell RNA sequencing at the levels that we were doing back in 2019 actually showed us these very unexpected pieces of the puzzle of the, the, the painting, that we, but we couldn't really get the whole thing. And as we do more and more single cell RNA sequencing, we get more and more of the puzzle revealed. And the point we're at now in these technologies and what we discussed in the research conference was actually how do we actually target our single cell approaches so that we get even more information in an area that we think is important. And eventually the goal is that we'll be able to reveal the painting um, in its entirety and actually identify things that we can intervene on. This is great for patients, right? Um, and it's great, this technology has a, a tremendous opportunity for patients because what we're doing as a community, as a research community in the lung and in other tissues, 
um, is we're trying to create uh, these molecular atlases of disease where we take disease tissues and healthy tissues and we compare all of the different cells in those tissues. And then we link those to clinical data. How did you do on serolimus? Did you respond to the serolimus or did you not respond? Did you have side effects? Did you not have side effects? Um, um, what were the different clinical attributes? And all of that data can actually be put together in one model, a virtual model, and machine learning tools like Google uses for your search engine and other things can then go into this and ask, what kind of lamb do you have? And how um, might you be different from other lamb patients? How might you be similar? And at the end goal is to say, what kind of therapy should you have um, for your lamb? Which one are you most likely to respond to? Um, this is where we want to be with this research. And what we talked about was sort of, where are we on the pathway towards doing that? And a lot of the, um, uh, all of the speakers that spoke at this conference actually talked about their own single cell data. Um, and even though we don't have a lot of single cell data in LAM, it's extremely information rich and we've learned so much. So this is the, that's, that's sort of a vision for this. The other part of this that we didn't talk about here, that I didn't talk about here is the spatial transcriptomics. The problem with this is that we take this all apart and this doesn't look like a lung anymore. Um, but there are ways that we're developing now where we can actually put these cells back into the context within, within the lung and actually understand how they are uh, located geographically within a tissue like the lung and actually include all of those data that I talked about um, uh, from, the, uh, 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 from the clinical uh, 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 phenotypes that we're looking at. So I hope that that actually didn't make things more confusing and made it hopefully less confusing because this is a it's a difficult technology, but it really is. Um, um, we are sort of learning anew about lung disease, and I think everybody that's engaged in these projects is really excited um, to apply them to patients with um, LAM. And I I I, I think that this is going to be empowering for patients because the data that are generated um, uh, as part of this are actually you're gonna be able as, as, as patients to actually allow your data to be used by researchers without risk of identification. Some of the beauty of this data is that it's, it's completely anonymized and we can sort of look at individual patients who can control their own data. So a lot of advantages to this technology and I think we see a bright future for it. Thank you very much. That's, uh, you led into about 10 more questions, but uh, I, I just want to know how many pieces of fruit are in that smoothie. Um, <laughs> I, I hazard a guess it must be tens of thousands. Well, well in, the, in the lung smoothies that we have, we're now up into millions of cells. So the, uh -huh. the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative has actually been doing a, a single cell atlas of the entire human body. And uh, the, uh, the lung cell atlas, which will be released actually next week, this is just the normal, or no, I'm sorry, next month, this is the normal lung cell atlas, will, con will contain uh, uh, several million cells from multiple different laboratories around the country. And what we're excited to do then is to take that normal atlas and take the data that everyone on this call and everyone in our conference was talking about and map it onto that data and say, what's different about LAM in every cell Right, not just the lamb cell between that lamb, that lamb lung and the, the lungs from normal patients, mm -hmm. and we've just never been able to do anything like that. And you know, rapid advances in both the sequencing technologies and in the computational approaches to analyzing these data are allowing that to be possible. It, it, it does appear to be moving extraordinarily quickly. I think the first time we we heard these words used together in a sentence was maybe in 2017. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Nishant, would uh, you like to comment from the uh, on the lamb part of this and what we just heard? Absolutely. Uh, before that, first of all, uh, thank you, Scott. That was a just absolutely fantastic description of of such a complex uh, technology. Uh, second, since Sue mentioned about uh, our kids, that's the reason I'm wearing headphones. Is I don't want people to hear screaming kids. I don't know how protective that will be, but. We'll see. And uh, and also want to echo what Scott said. It was uh, very inspiring to catch the tail end of the uh, cocktail hour. And, you know, uh, the patient community has heard this before from all of us, but we truly mean it when we say that in, in you just seeing this community together uh, and hearing your uh, thoughts and questions and 
uh, gives us new ideas for research and, and really drives us uh, to keep moving forward with a sense of urgency that otherwise may perhaps may not be there. So thank you. Uh, coming to the question that Sue posed about the implications of single cell for LAM, I think Scott has very nicely laid out that it we that this technology has now provided us a way to truly understand uh, the abnormalities that are happening in the LAM lung. Uh, and it is particularly relevant in a disease where we uh, do not have a animal model that fully captures what happens in human disease. So to be able to study that directly from uh, human tissue uh, and at a resolution that we have never had before, uh, you know, that, that is just amazing. And it truly is transformational because we are uh, really seeing LAM in a, at a new light, at a level that we have never been able to see before. I think you have to make me not the host because I'm being asked to admit people. <laughs> You're in charge now. We're going to sign yes. <laughs> Welcome to the LAM family. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Nishan. And you know, there was, a, there was another question I think we had a little bit later in the list, but since uh, I think we're um, getting close to it already, which is this idea of the, the larger need for strategic sharing and these massive data sets that are coming out of this technology. You, you mentioned the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and um, the, the, the different groups that are adding to this. I'd love to ask both of you to talk a little bit about what's happening in that arena. Uh, and, and patient consent is something that, that you touched on, on, Scott, that my experience with the, these rare disease communities has been the patients are willing and uh, I think eager to not have to sign another piece of paper every time, but what is evolving in this area of global data sharing and these massive data sets? Uh, uh, Scott, I, I, yeah. you, is that okay to go ahead, Nishan? Yes, please. Yes, so, so uh, these are both, those are great questions. Um, uh, the problem, so the problem that we've had, there've been two problems that we have with um, uh, uh, data um, and recently they've been solved. Um, so one of the one of the problems that we had was that you know when you have a matrix when you have a if you think about it you have thousands of cells and thousands of genes it's huge and so the computational intensity the computational resources that are needed to analyze that are um, are large um, and there's a large and there's also a large part of the process of that computational analysis that requires manual input uh, manual input. Somebody with biologic knowledge has to go and say that cell is a lung epithelial cell, that cell is a LAM cell, that cell is a, a lymphocyte, right? So it has to go through and say identify all those different cell populations. Um, and um, the the other problem that 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 has been there is that the data that that the go into those computational models, as you said, are identifiable. We could go and actually find out theoretically who you were using those genealogic archaeology. Um, types of tools to actually look and figure out who every person was if we had all the raw data. Um, and so as a result of that, what you see is multiple different small studies that have come out with like 10 to 12 patients, max, maybe 16, maybe 25, no large scale studies. Um, and what the solution to that problem has been that a lot of uh, uh, the a group of bioinformaticians have developed tools that let you move um, all of that data into, it's called a latent space, doesn't matter what it's called, it's, it's something in the cloud, think of it that way. Um, and as it moves into the cloud, um, it, uh, it uh, loses the identification. So now that data in the cloud is no longer identifiable, right? And that, that object that now, that's now comprised of 10 patients data is in the cloud. And then somebody else develops some, another set of data that's six patients with LAM. That goes into, the, into this model and, it, and improves that model. Um, and the annotations are actually um, integrated into the model so that the, the computer says, oh, I think this is probably a lymphocyte. This is a, this is a cell I've never seen. I'm gonna call this cell X. And then somebody will go in and say, I think that's a LAM cell. And then every cell it sees like that, it will call a LAM cell. And so these models get bigger and bigger over time. And over time, we can say, we can start to put clinical data in there. Like this is what this person's CT looked like, 
or this is what this person's response to Sirolimus was, or this is how, you know, this is what happened to this person during their pregnancy. All of those clinical data can also go in there. And so you now have this, this cloud-based multidimensional data set that you can start to ask these, these uh, integrated questions. And, and the nice thing is that the patient then shares the data with the cloud once, they don't have any identif identifying information there, and they are then going to be in there. And if they have, if they choose to, they can actually share their data so it updates the cloud as their clinical progress through the course of the disease goes on, right? So those, you know, so that the additional data can go into that. That's not there yet, right? But at this point, the tools are such that that's a achievable goal in the future, oh. in the not too distant future. There's no no barriers to that other than money. Very exciting. The, the um, ever hopeful LAM app where our patient community can enter what's happening to them and have it go somewhere that's meaningful, right? Yep. Yep. And yep. it will be tied then to, yep. Yep. We're close. Nishant, thoughts? Yeah. I, well, I think Scott has very well captured it. I mean, I just from the uh, uh, patient community's understanding on this is, uh, you know, we are just at the beginning of, of this technology and its application uh, in the context of LAM. Uh, if you think of the, the first set of single cell experiments out of the few hundred thousand cells that were identified from uh, the LAM lungs, there were only a few dozen cells that were identified as LAM cells. Uh, so as more and more data, as more and more experiments are being done on LAM tissue, the, the population of these LAM cells over time will grow. And, and as that population grows, as that information grows, so will the uh, ability and the power uh, to derive meaningful conclusions, uh, right? I mean, and, and as Scott mentioned, to link it with clinical questions, ultimately that is the goal, right? I mean, uh, we uh, yes, we need to gain better fundamental understanding, but ultimately we do need to link it back to the patients to have clinical utility from those findings. And, and that, is the, uh, that is the obvious next step that uh, I think we have to figure out how to get there, but that will get there. Well, and when you say a few dozen, and you literally mean a few dozen LAM cells, and we heard earlier on the cocktail hour that the, the journey from someone having to go through transplant to get that tissue to the lab only to have a few dozen, but then to know that that's going to be building an aggregate over time with more understanding, you can see that's, that's transformative. Uh, well, there was an um, shifting just a little bit, another topic from the research conference and one that uh, is a topic of conversation quite often is this uh, research into the, the immune system. And the fact that um, LAM cells have been able to be stealth and not be discovered by a woman's immune system. And I, I think that the question here is, is there hope that we can somehow reactivate the, the immune system to see LAM cells so that they don't proliferate the way they do? And um, I think I originally had this uh, targeted to you, Nishant, if you'd like to, to respond to that and then you can both respond. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so so as you nicely mentioned this this is this is not a novel context in the in the field of cancer biology right this this concept is now being uh, leveraged in a number of uh, human cancers where uh, you know you think of it as your immune system is uh, exists in your body to act as a as a guard against all sorts of foreign things malignancies included uh, but but cancer cells are sneaky in the way that they can uh, uh, they have found mechanisms to try to evade the immune system. In the context of LAM, for example, um, there has been some very nice work from both Vida Krimskaya and Lisa Hensky, where they have shown that the immune cells in, uh, in patients with LAM have, are positive for markers called checkpoints, which allow them to evade detection by the immune cells. Uh, work by Michael Borchers has uh, shown that LAM cells secrete certain molecules in the serum that allow them as decoys that allow them to evade detection by the immune system. Uh, now, uh, in other cancers, uh, uh, there are drugs that are now out and commonly used in FDA approved called checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, which allow your immune system to get activated and that attacks the cancer cells. Um, 
uh, another uh, set of experiments done by Carolyn Lapoule has shown that, you know, where you, if you genetically engineer the immune cells uh, and make them target the lamb antigens, that, that could also have uh, efficacy in lamb. So all of that is, uh, is very exciting, uh, is a very plausible uh, mechanism to target uh, treatment in lamb. Uh, but the word, a couple of words of caution there are and that one so far that data is uh, in animal models in cell line models that hasn't been tested in patients and the second is is a very simple newton's law if you will that every action has an equal and opposite reaction so when you stimulate the immune system uh, there is a chance that 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 stimulation will misfire and it will misfire at normal tissues at normal organs and that and that we have seen with check drugs like checkpoint inhibitors when used in cancers. So as we think of translating this in the context of LAM, I think we need to be careful and wary about the possibility of these side effects uh, and really take this uh, slow and uh, in a very measured manner. Uh, and the more specific we are in, in our ability to target the LAM cells, uh, the better off we will be in terms of avoiding the misfiring side effects, if you will. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, from your perspective, go ahead. Yeah, Scott. Yeah, I think I think that um, it's a fantastic question, and I think there's a lot of excitement around immunotherapy. And I see this as a, a place where um, the common disease can give back to the rare disease, you know, because it's usually the rare disease, you know, you, you don't realize it, but our study, the, the biology that's revealed by the study of rare diseases, um, it has really informed a lot of what we understand about you know, general lung health and uh, many other lung diseases. Um, I think that, that there's so much attention now that's uh, being focused on understanding these mechanisms of, of um, immune evasion in other cancers um, um, that, that, that this, these technologies that we're now applying to actually look at how, how cancers in general avoid the immune system is gonna give back to those LAM patients and say, these are therapies or tests that we can do on you to see if you're going to respond to those therapies um, that will allow us to move cautiously, as Nishant said, um, in highly selected patients um, um, with LAM with these different kinds of therapies. So I, I hope this is a chance for, for common disease to give back to rare. Very encouraging. We like to hear that the horses are gonna give back to the zebras. <laughs> Um, excellent. Um, so another topic that came up a lot on the uh, August call was the, the concept and the need for more and better biomarkers. And so I, I, we, we would be remiss if we didn't spend some time. And Scott, I was wondering if you could comment on the, um, what the unique advantages are of this, these new technologies in helping us find better biomarkers or um, and then how do we how do we validate how good they are? Yeah, um, two two questions. Second one's harder than the first. So the first okay. one, I'll do easier. the um, the uh, um, the nice thing about the single cell RNA sequencing is because, as Nishant said, it gives us this very very high resolution view of even samples that, that are relatively non invasively obtained, like blood or or, um, uh, um, or a, a BAL fluid, for example, from a bronchoscopy without a biopsy. Um, and um, the, the problem with most biomarkers is the smoothie problem, right? If you have some rare biomarker that's very important and then you measure it, if it's one drop in the, the whole, you know, 10 ml of blood, essentially, right? You're gonna miss it, right? And it's not gonna be very precise. Um, what we can do is we can use the single cell RNA-seq to say, okay, What's different about that cell is these three genes that are there. And then we can say um, those three genes then go into three proteins. And we have single cell technologies that we use in the clinic all the time, like flow cytometry, which is actually a protein-based single cell technology. That's actually how we got interested in this is that we had a lot of interest in flow cytometry. Um, and that can actually be very adapted, ad ad that can be easily adapted by any clinical lab. So every clinical lab in the country has flow cytometry, right? And so the idea is that we identify potential biomarkers from these single cell data. We validate that the protein is there. We then develop 
protein-based assays that can be clinically used to detect those rare cells, right? Those one in a thousand or one in a 10,000 events. Um, and then we, um, uh, and then validation though is still gonna require, um, um, you know, uh, uh, following patients clinically to make sure that those biomarkers are, are correct, are identifying, are predicting the way that we think they will. Our, we're ho our hope is that we will be wrong less often. Um, using a single cell technology. Excellent. Nishan, did you have a comment? Yeah, uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, so since Scott has covered the aspect of how single cell can give us more specific biomarkers, right? I think that concept is very important to understand that as we think of a biomarker to have clinical utility, the more deep rooted in basic disease biology, the biomarker we choose, the better the chances of, of that truly being a clinically meaningful or useful biomarker. I think as, you know, sometimes that's a concept that, uh, that we often lose sight of as we are uh, thinking about biomarkers, but that I think we, we would all be well suited to have that basic theme in mind. Uh, I'll touch on just uh, some specific examples which where I think the LAM community, they, they may be sick of hearing the word biomarkers. I just want to explain uh, why we think biomarkers uh, are such an important uh, thing for the LAM community. So uh, think of all the facets, various facets of clinical uh, paradigm in LAM. So start, let's start with diagnosis. Uh, like it was not too long ago when patients, the only way to diagnose patients or the most common way to diagnose patients was with the lung biopsy. But now with the help of serum VEGFD, we are able to avoid a lung biopsy in 60% of the patients. So that's uh, you know one of the best examples of a biomarker in all of clinical medicine. The, uh, but that 60%, uh, I think is not good enough, right? We need to reach a stage where we are not needing lung biopsy at all. So there's the first need where we need a biomarker. Uh, the second need is, you know, often LAM patients uh, are torn whether they should start treatment or not. Uh, can we predict uh, whether they are going to progress? Uh, and can that help us dictate when they should start treatment? And at this point in time, we don't have a good biomarker or a set of biomarkers uh, which could really help us predict individual to individual patients in the clinic what their course is going to look like. Uh, the next stage is, you know, can we predict how someone will respond to treatment? Uh, and again, we don't have uh, great biomarkers which can help answer these questions. And perhaps the biggest utility or biggest need for biomarkers in the context of LAM is we talk about new treatments, what is potentially new, uh, what is potentially exciting, what can we target to treat LAM, but uh, in a, in a post-serolimus world, uh, you know, I'm going to pose this as a problem, but just, be, just to be clear, this is a good problem to have. We don't have a good marker to assess efficacy of treatment. Serolimus was assessed based on lung function. If you're talking about treatments that are added on top of serolimus, the utility of lung function to give you the signal to assess efficacy uh, may not be a very practical endpoint. So we need very specific biomarkers that can truly convince us that, what, that the treatment we are studying is actually having efficacy. And so I, anyway, I just wanted to yeah. point out these few areas where, uh, where it is absolutely critical that we have better biomarkers that allow us to find, to just hope that we reach a stage of precision medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and this is so important as we, um, on the cocktail hour and in all of our conversations, while women with LAM have LAM in common, their experience with LAM is so very different. And knowing how they might respond to treatment, knowing how quickly things might progress, prognostic, diagnostic, different, different and better ways to be able to more easily measure that instead of a PFT, or that doesn't even tell us, right, is, is just um, so much interest and in, in potential benefit. Absolutely. Good. Any other thoughts or comments on, on biomarkers? We, we kill it? Okay. Yeah. 
How you much know, time do we have? Another, we have, well, we have another, <laughs> another easy topic coming up. Uh, always a lot of interest about uh, the role of hormones uh, and hormones in lamb. So it, hormonal involvement has, has long been, you know, this, this question and the predominance of lamb and females, the slowing of the progression of the disease after menopause, acceleration of the disease during pregnancy. Um, despite knowing all of this, it's just uh, remains a, a very difficult and a major unmet need to have more answers in this area. Um, so I, I guess I'd like to ask what our hope is related to the single cell data. Um, will this provide us more insights into the female sex hormones and their role in lamb progression? And I'm going to throw that up for you two to fight over who, who wants to take it. And I'll take it. I'll, I'll take it because I, I do think, um, you know, I think that it's going to be difficult. It's going to be difficult to actually study that that in humans um, because it's hard to, you know, because it, it's it, especially if you're talking about issues like pregnancy um, or um, uh, there's no way to really intervene on, on, on sex hormones and things like that. What I think the single cell data can do, and, and you know, we heard some examples of this in the seminar, is that it can tell us um, how similar some of the animal models that we're using are to the human disease. So, you know, the, the, those, cur I showed you everything I showed you was human lungs, right? And that slide, but we can do that in a mouse lung just as easily or any other animal. Um, and um, there's a lot of a lot of similarities when we look at some of our other models of lung disease uh, between the human and the, the mouse model. And if there's not, we can actually see them. So we can see what's wrong with the model. So I think that what this is, what we're gonna, the way that we'll be able to address these questions using the single cell technologies is taking what we know is ground truth, that is the human disease, that's what we wanna understand. And then comparing an animal model that somebody might develop to look at the human, uh, the effect of sex hormones, or pregnancy, we heard some exciting data about, you know, acceleration of lamb-like phenotypes in mice during pregnancy. Um, you know, and we can use the single cell data to say what's likely to be true and what's not, right? And so that's, I think that's gonna be, it's gonna be sort of a, it gives us a ground truth. It gives us, you know, this is the human disease. And if it doesn't look like the human disease, let's not study this anymore, right? Let's go to a different model that looks like the human disease maybe we're onto something, right? And then we can start to confirm it in the human, in the in patients. Makes sense. Here's the field, Nishan. Yeah, I agreed with everything that Scott said. And also that, you know, this is, this is a very difficult and a very complex topic. And, and, you know, and perhaps that's the reason why, despite all the observations that you already mentioned, Sue, it's, it's not uh, reached a stage where it has been you know, clinically uh, useful in terms of treatment. I mean, anti-hormone treatment strategies have been used in lamb ever since uh, lamb was discovered to be a female predominant disease, but they haven't really uh, led to a benefit at a population level. Uh, you know, I, I think at least in my view, I think that's that's uh, something that we need to tackle, however difficult and however complex it might be. Um, you know, the, we haven't done these studies in a controlled fashion. Uh, I personally, my belief is we haven't targeted or found the right subset of population uh, where anti-hormonal uh, strategies might be beneficial in LAM. And, and I think as we move along in this field, that's something else we need to focus on. Is there a subset of patients within LAM where this, uh, where this kind of strategy might be more beneficial? Interesting. Difficult and complex. Sounds like the kind of stuff we've been doing for the last 25 years, right? Um, I know there are there are a lot more more um, questions to be answered, but that that is um, exciting just to, to think that we can narrow uh, from the outset through the single cell data um, how to approach those questions, um, which I think hasn't been possible uh, in recent years. So um, let's see, I'm going back to the questions that we had. 
do you know it, it did come up and I think you mentioned it I just wanted to see if there was any other comment related to the the challenge we've had with creating animal models that really replicate what's happening um, with with lamb as a disease I know that it's we've got some good ones but still lacking something some um, accuracy I guess is the word um, do either of you want to comment a little bit more on the that that situation with the development of animal models uh, yeah I can uh, take this first I think uh, I think your comment captures uh, the majority of it which is that you know we've uh, we have used various cell lines and various uh, animal models over the years to study lamb and they have uh, they they do capture a lot of features of human disease but uh, but they haven't fully captured uh, the formation of lung cysts that um, is the hallmark of lamb uh, in humans um, and so that that has been at least in my mind that has been a major shortcoming of animal models which makes you think that are we truly studying the same uh, disease in animals that we are trying to address in humans. Uh, I think there has been some recent advancements in animal models. We heard a very exciting model from Vida's presentation at the August conference. Uh, there are uh, some new developments in there uh, in other labs as well. Uh, Steve Hamas's model looks very promising. Uh, in this regard, Michael Borchers is uh, having some uh, uh, some good prelim luck in in uh, in his lab on this, so I think it is uh, it is looking very promising that we will have better animal models that that uh, recapitulate or look like the human disease. And as Scott mentioned, the that's one of the I think the key advantages of single cell technology is that if we can hone down on the cell of origin of lamb, uh, we can create a better animal model for lamb. Yeah, that was one of our prior questions that I neglected to ask, which was the importance of this cell of origin. Um, and I, I think I did have that directed to you, Nishant, but um, do you want to say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think I uh, that was the punchline was of it? that, that was, was that the, in that that the cell of origin can help us uh, make better animal models. But you know, uh, beyond that, that's been a question that has been vexing us for decades. Right? We all know that lamb cells start from somewhere, uh, migrate up the lymphatics, end up in the lung, where they cause progressive destruction. But it's always been well, where do these cells start from? Uh, you know, if you understand that cell of origin, you know, you can understand the basic biology better, but you can also have other implications. For example, uh, not in sporadic lamb, but in perhaps in patients with TSC, if you know where lamb is originating, you could think about preventative strategies. Uh, but, you know, again, the biggest benefit mm -hmm. of, of knowing the cell of origin really is that I think that gives us hope to get better animal models. And, and I, I think the other thing that the, the single cell data tells us that we haven't been able to answer before is what are the potential ways that those cells of origin might be communicating with other cells in the lung? Um, you know, and so, so we can start to look at the, you know, not just the, the driver mutations that are there in, the, in the, the cell of origin, but ask what are the pathways that are activated downstream of that that might be important in signaling the development of lung cysts as Nishant talked about. In that, that probably involves actually different cell populations. It's not the cell of origin that's doing that. It's somehow misdirecting the normal developmental pathways in the lung. And we can start to think about targeting those in addition to giving like a therapy of serolimus that, part, that targets the driver mutation. It takes us back to this micro environment where all kinds of communications are going on. Um, uh, with you know bad things or different things than would normally be happening in the lung, yes. Right. right. Well, we are, um, time flies. We are already pushing toward the end of our hour. And I think I would really like to give each of you a little bit of time to reflect on the, the August conference, um, tonight's conversation, and maybe share a little bit about what you has you most excited and intrigued as we look to the future of not only these technologies, but specifically these technologies with LAM. And um, Nishant, would you, would you open that up for us? 
Absolutely. Uh, well, uh, first of all, I, I uh, while I have the time, I, I do want to uh, thank Scott for uh, you know doing just such an amazing and masterful job at the August conference uh, for agreeing to uh, spend an evening away from family uh, tonight, uh, and and really for so much insight that you have brought into this field and and for your generosity and for all the time that you've given uh, and given for LAM over the past few weeks. So thank you very much for that. Uh, a couple other uh, things that I, as I uh, look at the list of patients up there that I want to mention is it is inspiring over the, at least over the past year, year and a half to see that as our world got upended with, with the pandemic, uh, that the strength and the bond of the community is so strong that we've been able to make all these virtual connections and and find ways to connect with both the patient and the scientific communities uh, and still be uh, connected at such a strong level i think that is very inspiring uh, from a uh, clinical research standpoint i'd say one positive that has come out of uh, the pandemic has also been just uh, what we have found is the the impact or the positive impact that telehealth can have, especially in a rare disease research, uh, do not have to have patients travel uh, halfway across the country for every little visit. Uh, I think that uh, I just wanted to mention that, but coming back to the topic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited about uh, where these technologies uh, will lead us towards a better understanding of LAM at, and at a much faster pace than what we have been able to um, achieve so far. And I think this gives us hope for better, more specific biomarkers and better, more specific uh, targets for therapies. Uh, and patients hear this from me all the time, but I'll say this again. I, this, is, this is really an exciting time for LAM science and, and the future. It truly is very bright and you, you have all the reason to be optimistic. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Nishant. And, you know, it's, it's um, not, it was absolutely my uh, complete pleasure to be part of this, uh, this conference and part of the, this foundation's activities. Um, you, the, the patients here um, may not realize it, but their work um, has led to um, uh, the funding of really scientists that have done fantastic work, not just in LAM, but in the entire field of lung biology. And we're really all, I think the whole community is indebted to the work that you're doing in the foundation. And, and many patients with lung diseases other than LAM have benefited from the, the work that you've supported. Um, so it's, it's absolutely my pleasure. I, I, you know, I, this is, uh, I would just echo what Nishant is saying. You know, we started, to, if you go back historically, the way we defined disease was somebody took a biopsy from a patient, generally a patient that had died, an autopsy, and looked at it under the microscope. And they looked at sort of the way the cells looked, and they looked at maybe if they were lucky, they had a protein they could stain for, right? One or two. We now can take um, a, a lung from a patient um, or any tissue from a patient, and now we can look at all of the genes in every cell in that tissue, um, and we can look at it organizationally. And so what we're, not, we're seeing is really um, a, a redefinition of lung disease, a redefinition of pathology, um, and, um, uh, and we're actually seeing sort of the automation um, of those processes with us being able to, it, taking that, that pathologic data that, that's just in a lab and integrating it with all this clinical information. So I, I think there's a, that, that we're just, as Nishant actually said earlier in the, the, the discussion, we are just uh, um, sort of opening our eyes and getting a glimpse of what we're gonna be able to see. Um, and it's so exciting that I think everybody is really just eager to, to keep looking. Um, and to get this uncovered as quickly as possible. And I'm not, I'm not positive any of us at this stage know what we're gonna find, um, but we found so much with so little already, we're pretty excited. Well, thank, thank you both. Thank you, Scott, for um, joining, our, joining our team and, and sharing your expertise. It's, uh, it's really a, a delight. I, I think the speed at which this is happening is the thing that really is exciting, I think, for me. And, and as I hear the, the LAM community is the rapidity with which this, this technology is evolving, all right? And as you said, you don't really know what you're going to find, but you'll probably find something out sooner than, than, than certainly you would have in the past. 
Yes. Um, and um, thank you as well, Nishant, for coordinating along with our, our team here at the Lamb Foundation, the August, the August conference. And uh, I would also echo this, not only for telehealth, but our ability as a foundation to stay close uh, and, and um, connected with our patient community and, and move things forward. So I have just a few closing comments. I, I hope that you'll both uh, stay on for just a few minutes as we sign off for the night. We've got some pretty spectacular news to share on, the, on this uh, day of giving uh, for, for 2021. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. So I, uh, I certainly learned a lot again, uh, and the research progress and, and scientific commitment are the courage of our patients to participate in all of this research and not just participate, but inspire us to ask new and important questions is continues to be awe inspiring. I, I, a few thank yous to our donors. I'll report on that here in a minute. Um, I want to thank a couple of sponsors for today's event, Novartis, as well as the National Disease Research Interchange that we mentioned earlier, helping us with our tissue donation process. A very special thank you to each and every member of the board of directors of the Lamb Foundation, um, our absolutely incredible Lamb Foundation staff, uh, Nishan Gupta, our scientific network, the early career researchers who are stepping up to join this LAM family and push LAM science forward, and our clinic directors uh, from around the world who keep the treatment of LAM much closer to home. As of right now, I believe um, I'm refreshing my screen for this uh, amazing day of giving. And it looks like we have not only surpassed our hope of raising $335,000 today, that we're, we're clearly over 400,000. Um, and I think that there's actually a few additional gifts being entered right now. So we'll come back to that in just a few more minutes. Remember, even though we've exceeded our goal, every dollar that's raised in this campaign is going to potentially life-saving research. Um, and 100% of every dollar will be, will be directed to research. Over time, um, the existence of the Lamb Foundation, we directed more than $17 million to fund basic clinical and translational research projects. And those scientists, as you've heard in our videos, have turned around and turned that into an estimated 50 million um, in research for, for Lamb. Uh, in places like the National Institutes of Health, the NHLBI, the Department of Defense, and the FDA have all supported the work that we've built on from this foundation. So I think everyone knows that the gifts received today will benefit LAM research for years to come. Thank you so much for joining us for this day of giving, our virtual cocktail hour and our research summary. We are sincerely hope to be with everyone together next year. If that is at all possible, we will work to make it happen. And for now, I just want to express uh, my sincere gratitude on behalf of the team here at the foundation for all of you and for your ongoing support. The final total of our day of giving will be reported uh, probably somewhat tomorrow and then over the next couple of weeks as additional pledges and gifts come in. Thank you to everyone and have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you, Sue. Wonderful. Uh, Wonderful. Welcome, Julie. Good to see everyone. Great to see everyone.